Man, what a year it's been here. Wake me up when it's over. Anybody else feel like that? Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, it's been quite a week, too, actually, and uh, we're not even sure that everything is over yet. And I'll tell you, you know, COVID's ramping up, and, and uh, the election hopefully winding down, and all these. How many of you remember, uh, I, t- I did a devotional way back at the beginning of this in front of the roller coaster at Adventureland, and talked about fear over faith, and kind of illustrated the arc of COVID, and talked about the ups and downs, and we can choose fear. And uh, man, how many are ready to get off of this wild ride? You liked roller coasters before, but I about had enough of that. Well, you've heard it said that the only constant in the world is change. And that's not all bad. Uh, Change is necessary. Change can be good. But uh, change can also be unsettling and unnerving because uh, change means uncertainty. But I don't want to focus tonight on the things that might unsettle us or frustrate us or or keep us on edge. Instead, I want to uh, encourage you and actually more than that to inspire you to grab a hold of God's destiny for the church and to get excited and to begin to celebrate the fact that no matter what's going on in the world around us, uh, God's truth is marching on and uh, he has already won the victory for us. In fact, 1 John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So tonight I'm going to draw a stark contrast between the ways of the world and the ways of God. And when I was thinking of what to title this message tonight, if it needs a title, I decided to call it uh, No Contest. Because uh, uh, when it comes to the world's way versus God's way, uh, it isn't even close. It's no contest. It's a settled fact. It's something certain. Something we already know. Even if it doesn't always show. But tonight... We're going to show confidence in our faith in God through a time of prayer because that's where the contest, that's where the battle uh, is won. But before we go to a time of prayer, I want to highlight several uh, points of contrast that emphasize how the world cannot and never will prevail over God and his people. Psalm chapter 102, verses 25 through 27 say, In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. My first point is simply this. The world constantly changes, but God never changes. He never changes. Now, change is inevitable, as I said. It's not a bad thing. Uh, In fact, we can't even be made right right with God uh, apart from repentance, which literally implies a change of of mind and and heart and direction. But only God can make that kind of a change. Uh, The kind of change we make can't cut it. The kind of change that the world enacts is not the kind of life-giving change that only God can make. Change that's instigated by the worldly sources is disruptive and temporary. But change that comes from God is transformational and eternal. You know, the world prides itself on, on change, on being a progressive, on being enlightened and trying to improve ourselves through all kinds of uh, physical and mental and social processes of evolution But regardless of the positive spin that the world puts on its brand of change, it still brings instability and insecurity and dissatisfaction. In fact, even when the change uh, is aimed at finding a better way of life, a more productive or, or profitable or even peaceful way of life, the world's attempts at meaningful change are almost always self serving and often self-destructive. In fact, even when the change seems positive, it still brings anxiety because in this world, we never know what's ahead. Even when we're serving God, uh, there's uncertainty because God doesn't give us every answer. God doesn't show us everything he's up to. He doesn't always tell us what's down the road. But the difference between the world's kind of uncertainty and the uncertainty that we face in serving God is that that kind of uncertainty is simply an opportunity to grow in our faith because we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that's why we can have the confidence uh, that it says in James 1.17 that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. And just like God the Father, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today 
and forever. So although the world is constantly changing, God never changes. And that means our faith is always on a firm foundation. Now that's quite the opposite of the world because things are pretty shaky out there. And that's the second thing I want to remind you of tonight is when the world seems out of control, God is still in control. There's been a lot of unrest in in the, the last several months, civil, social unrest, racial tensions, all of that going on in the midst of a worldwide uh, pandemic, and then comes uh, the most uh, volatile election cycle that we've probably seen in our lifetime. On top of that, we've got natural disasters that have happened from coast to coast, and that's just stuff that's happening in our country. There are even worse things happening in other parts of the world, and we can't control any of it. And when we do try to control things, what happens? We usually make them worse. But I don't care uh, what we do, no matter how we mess things up, God is still and always will be in control. People might reject him, they might try to replace him, ignore him, and dismiss him, but he has never abdicated his throne. Psalm 103, verse 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. In Psalm 66, it says he rules by his power. His eyes watch the nations. He knows what's going on. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. I was listening this week uh, to a little snippet from a Billy Graham sermon. I believe Pastor even posted online. And some of you may have seen it. And he was preaching from the book uh, of Habakkuk, which talks about the rise of the Babylonian Empire, and, uh, the, an empire that was uh, defiant of God and, and ruthless and had no regard for people. And yet God was allowing them to be raised up. And they were going to begin to take over other nations, including God's own people. And that didn't sit well with Habakkuk. And he was saying, God, how can this be? I don't get it. You've got to show me what you're up to because this doesn't make sense and God said to Habakkuk I'm not going to show you because if I did you wouldn't believe what I'm doing and a lot of times if God showed us what he was up to I guarantee some of you would get fearful other times if God showed us what he was doing we'd get uh, excited we'd get over anxious or we might get complacent Sometimes we'd even try to get ahead of where God wants to be when he's just saying, wait just a minute. Other times we're stuck in the mud while he's trying to push us on. But if God showed us everything he was doing, we would need to trust him. And that's what really matters. And that's the lesson we can learn right now with all that's going on in our nation and what's happened throughout the world. Everything we've seen, point number three, is that worldly governments, nations, and civilizations will rise and fall but God's word remains and his plans will prevail. Psalm, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Now, we've just come through a process where a lot of political candidates have told us uh, what they intend to do to make our lives better and to put our nation on a path to success, but those are people's plans. Those aren't God's plans, and the nations they affect will come and go. They will rise and fall along with the leaders. Now, God works through human leadership. I mean, even leaders who may not acknowledge him or know him personally, uh, even when their plans don't appear to serve God's purposes. Romans 13, 1 talks about being subject to the leaders God establishes. And sometimes God lets leadership arise uh, that is the product of our own desires and our rebellion. Leaders who take us down the path that we've chosen so we can experience the consequences and see the error of our ways. And all throughout Scripture, we see that God, like that nation of Babylon, he allowed corrupt nations to arise and governments to be instruments of correction and judgment. A lot of times to wake God's people up. To say, I can't depend on the things in this world because our only hope is God. Earthly governments will come and go and they will fail us in the process. But God will never fail us. Now, I know it's easy to get discouraged and to lose heart when we see everything around us and our society is gravitating more rapidly than ever toward godlessness, but God is still in control. And wavering circumstances and corrupt culture never diminish his power or his purpose for the church. In fact, even when uh, changes in society and government, which some of us are fearful of now, begin to limit our liberties and encroach on our faith, righteous men and women will always flourish, even through unexpected transition and unjustified opposition, even in the midst of ungodly cultures. We said that all throughout the Word. You look at, at people like Joseph, 
who was uh, sold out by his brothers and taken into slavery uh, down into Egypt and, and uh, became a servant in somebody's household. And even then, in the prospect of never seeing his family again, he maintained his integrity and rose up through that. And then somebody uh, turns on him and uh, brings false witness. He ends up in prison. Many people by that time would have given up. But he maintained his integrity. He kept focus on the Lord to the point where he could speak for God and through circumstances that most of you know, he rose up to uh, the second in command in all the nation in the midst of all that. You look at Moses who came centuries later in Egypt who uh, had to be abandoned at birth to spare his life and scooped out of the river by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the courts of Egypt, educated. He was raised to be a, a prince in Egypt. He didn't know anything about his background, but when he found that out, he chose to abandon all that and to begin to look for God's purposes and serve them, become one of the greatest men of God ever. You look at people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who in their teens uh, were taken away from family and, and captured into Babylon, and they became subjects of that kingdom and educated in all of their uh, arts and language and literature and all those things. And through it all, they maintained their integrity, and God used them. And, and even when, when they faced opposition and stood for God and, and things came against them, God delivered Daniel from the lion's den. He delivered Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego from the fiery furnace because they strayed true to God. But all this happened in the midst of an ungodly culture. You look at, at, at people like, uh, like Esther in Persia, taken from her home and, and groomed uh, in the king's harem. And her uncle approaches her at one point and says, but who knows that God may have raised you up for a time such as this. And she boldly approached the king and was able to spare her people. That's what God can do. You look throughout the New Testament. When did God's church flourish? It was when they were uh, taken throughout and scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And the more they were persecuted, the more the church grew. And all throughout history, God's people have been torn from family, driven from their homes, taken captive and imprisoned by enemies, stripped of their rights, and forced to live in in corrupt cultures and serve ungodly leaders. Some were ultimately deprived of their lives, but they understood what the scripture said in Hebrews 13, chapter 6. And so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid of what mere mortals can do to me. And when we grasp that truth, we'll not only survive in the midst of an ungodly culture, but we'll thrive and accomplish great things for God. Because again, Romans 8, 28 says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those of who are, love him and are called according to his purpose. I'll give you a bonus point here. This wasn't even in my original points. I kind of threw it in this afternoon. And that is, the world may rob us of temporary freedoms, but God gives us eternal freedoms And nobody can ever take those away. You know the old song, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And John 8, 36, if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. When Daniel was taken captive into Babylon, it may appear that he was subject to an ungodly culture, and that was it. But he was free through his faith in God, and that's why he could write in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all the kingdoms of the world and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. And that's why we don't put our hope and trust in Washington, D.C., or pin our hopes on a president. Our hope is in the Lord and in him alone because we must never forget, and this is my final point, the world's ways will fail and pass away, but God's word will never fail or pass away. Isaiah chapter 40 tells us that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You know, in politics and government, we become so accustomed to deceit and dishonesty, but not so with God. Numbers chapter 23 tells us that God is not human, that he should lie. He is not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And Psalm 119, 89, a psalm all about the word of God says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. So no matter how this world tries to shape your thinking, or shape your faith. It cannot rob your joy or your purpose if your life is found in a God's word. Listen, things are going to get tougher in the days ahead. 
But I believe that right alongside some of the most extreme opposition the church has ever faced, we're going to see the greatest revival of all time. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But you can take heart in the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 43. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Notice God never said we wouldn't go through the fire. Never said that we wouldn't be nearly overwhelmed by the flow. But he said that he would be with us and he would bring us through it. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Whatever happens, whatever comes our way in this world, Christ's followers should never take the posture that we're just holding the fort, we're holding on for dear life, but instead of lamenting hardship, we need to see it as an opportunity to get closer to Christ and to come closer to that time when we will be with Christ. In Luke chapter 21, the Bible describes all kinds of trouble and turmoil, all kinds of deception and disaster and opposition, all kinds of persecution and judgment that's going to come in the last days. And we're not quite there yet. But the Bible says when it does come, it doesn't tell us to cower in the dark and pray for a way of escape. It says when you see these things happening and begin to take place, stand up, lift your heads, for the redemption of the Lord draws nigh. And because of that, we can have a love and a joy and a peace that regardless of what happens in this world, that was the assurance that Jesus gave his people when he said in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's what a fearful world needs to see in us. They need to see an unconditional love. They need to see an uncommon joy and a supernatural peace. Things that everyone in this world is looking for, but no one can seem to find in the midst of all the trouble and fear. But when they see those traits in us, they'll see something and realize that we've got something real, something that's worth hanging on to no matter what, something that they don't have, but something that they know that they need. They need to see in us something so real, so life-altering that nothing can shake it. It doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. It doesn't mean we're not going to go through trouble or have stress or uncertainty. But through it all, we keep the faith because God's truth will stand and his purposes will prevail. So don't put your hope in a leader or a government or any worldly institution But in the one that the Bible describes in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Lord Almighty. The fact is that world leaders are going to come and go. Governments are going to change hands. Countries and civilizations are going to rise and fall. But unlike the world, the Lord never changes. He is always in control And he will never, ever fail us. And because of those facts, there are several things that can happen in our lives. But I know a couple of them is it frees us to have faith and confidence and assurance in the midst of a crazy world. But it also is something that needs to press us toward prayer. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Pastor Brett, would you come and just begin to play? I didn't want to talk long tonight because I want the focus to be on prayer. Our nation needs prayer as much as it's ever ever needed it. There's a lot of healing that needs to take place. And our politicians promise that that's what they're going to bring. They're going to facilitate that. They can't bring it. Only God can bring that kind of healing. Only God can bring the restoration that we need. Only God can bring the things that will touch our spirits and change us from the inside out, bringing people together, Uh, making lives whole and accomplishing things that only he can accomplish because his purposes will be done. Be assured of that. That's what I want to get across to you tonight as much as any. In the midst of whatever else you see, God's purposes are going on. I think maybe what's going on as much as anything now, no matter how how things shake out before it's all said and done, is God showing us that you're not supposed to depend on any of this. Some of you put your hopes just a little too much in the wrong place. Because it doesn't matter who sits in Washington, D.C. What matter who sits on the throne of heaven and who sits on the throne of our heart. And so tonight we're going to go to a time of prayer. And we just put up that list of things we're going to pray for. 
And throughout this time, may you may focus on uh, any number of those at any given time, but we're just going to kind of go through them. We're going to spend maybe a couple minutes or, or so on each of these issues. And I want to encourage you as we begin this time of prayer. I'm not going to talk us through it. I may ask some of the pastors to come up and just kind of wrap up every so often with some of these things and, and lend another voice to it. But I want to encourage you to take a posture that, that gets you kind of uh, maybe more on the offense in prayer. Whether that's just sitting where you're at. Maybe you want to kneel where you're at. Maybe some of you just want to come to this altar. I like to walk and pray. I just like to get in motion. And maybe you just to do that because uh, we need something in our spirit. We need an intensity to kind of go along with our prayers at times to really get us into it. So I'm just to encourage you to find that place or take that posture of prayer as we begin to take these things to God tonight. And let's trust that he'll do what only he can do. So right now, I just want us to begin and, and put it where, squarely where God says the focus needs to be. He said, if my people who are called by my name, that's us, will humble themselves and pray to seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's when he would hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal us. So we need to pray for a spiritual awakening in the church of America. We need to pray for churches to, to come alive. We need to pray for churches who aren't preaching the, the word uh, fully because they're afraid of what the culture may think to get with it. And we just need God to do that. So would you just join me right now? Find that place wherever it may be right now. And let's just spend a few moments right now asking God to awaken the church uh, in America and to bring humility and repentance so God can bring healing and revival to our land.